My true home is anywhere there is practice. I have found, because Adam also has really been influenced by the monastic path in Christianity. In our ecumenical institute was very much grounded in this, you have a daily discipline of something and you have a corporate communal practice, which is a daily, everyday, daily life thing. So having that as my <laughs> zero to 14 context, and then 15 years in a monastery as a Buddhist nun, that kind of monastic and communal framework that then he's really been influenced by the, the monastic elements in Christianity and Christian mysticism. That's really what we're both now wanting to head towards is a community that's both Buddhist and Christian in expression, but that has this practice element of a daily schedule and community and some kind of training, some kind of study, some kind of work, some kind of rest. A rhythm that allows folks to really drop into what is deeper than what's happening on the surface and to feel this body of people that is doing the same thing. It's not that everything I have received I just take unquestioningly like oh, I want to recreate, but, but there is this, there are elements of this monastic commitment and discipline that I know, I just feel like it's so hard if you don't have that. <laughs> if you're trying to keep yourself spiritually afloat in this crazy world by yourself, you're just using most of your energy to just keep the main things going. So you only have a teeny bit of energy for your spiritual development. But if you're in a community, if you have this rhythm where you are forced to stop, basically, forced to stop, and let all the thinking of the mind kind of recede, at least that's not what you're, it's not motivating. You can't just jump up and do that next task that your mind tells you you have to do. You have to sit there. You just have to marinate. If you have that kind of consistency, you just have much more energy in your mind, your mind energy, to look at these deeper questions, which we really need to be looking at. Having come out of monastic life into this world and that moves so much faster, I really am just seeing like, wow, it's not that it's not possible to live a deep and spiritual life outside of a monastic context, it is. It's just, you have, the wind is blowing right in your face all the time. And with more people, and with a structure, with a little bit more of a, a membrane around you, because that's something I really experienced living in the monastery. I was behind a membrane. <laughs> I wasn't as accessible personally. As a group, we were very accessible. But I didn't need to be accessible personally. I didn't need people to be able to call me. Or I was there showing up to eat, make beds, to do walking meditation with the community. So that's how I was needed and that's how I could offer. I had this protection against all of the ways life really, you know, inserts itself and, <laughs> and takes you away from what is always there under the surface, this kind of ability to rest in what is. What I really noticed when I left the monastery was, wow, I don't have any of that protection. I have to do everything. I have to do all the things that many people were doing in the monastery. And so much more energy is going more outward. I recognize that this is me personally. For other people, this more solitary or engaged life in the world, that's really what they need or at different times in our life. But I see for the way I was raised and the way I've lived, the kind of way my mind easily gets scattered. <laughs> it's really helpful for me personally also to have a kind of structure and a kind of container that I'm not the only one responsible for <laughs> creating. When I look at my journey living in community for most of my life until I was 40 basically, 
And even in college, I chose the most communal settings to live in. I have needed this time outside of community, residential community. And I, I really experienced this. I needed to individuate. I needed to see how much it cost me to, <laughs> to do all these things that were kind of just held in this larger field in the community. I think that was really important for me to grow up, actually, to be lonely. And when I would sit there in my apartment in DC and eat by myself, which I had always had people around me but pretty much to eat with, like that very basic thing of eating your meals like alone. I was like, you know, this is how a lot of people eat. A lot of people are very lonely. So all of that felt important for me to touch and to taste and to know. And also just to know I could take care of myself, just me in an apartment. <laughs> I could take care of myself financially, I could take care of myself socially, I could take care of myself spiritually. And I was still related to communities and teaching and engaging, but it was an important. I'm really glad my life has unfolded the way it's unfolded. And now in this partnership, like figuring out how do you live with another person? Okay, I figured out how to do this by myself, but now, now two paths have to blend and that's its own set of challenges and, and gifts and, and wonders. I can see both of us, because we both had this really strong monastic theme in our lives, we're both heading back there. Or, or wanting to kind of keep spiraling to, to that place of basically a more spiritually committed way of life where there are just certain things that aren't questioned. Both Adam and I feel like from the beginning of our relationship we were kind of guided. Like the way we came together, it just felt like we were led to each other. And the timing was so, like, exactly right, like, <laughs> amazing. A few months before he reached out to me, he really started praying and saying, I really feel like I, to really complete my life now as a priest, I need a partner. And very soon we connected and a phase was finishing in my life that really allowed me then to be very, it was like perfect timing for, for me to meet Adam. And as soon as we talked on our first Zoom call, I finished the call, it was two hours long. I was like, oh, this is the person. It was just a friendly call. We'd, we'd never met, but we were just connecting as friends. And then, oh, this is the person. <laughs> and he had the same feeling. And with the next Zoom call, we were talking about me coming to New York. <laughs> So it was this immediate kind of recognition. And I say that because the first time we really took a vacation together, we went away to a friend's mountain house for a week. And we just started talking about what do we each see in our future? What's our vision for where we want to go? And within 30 minutes, this thing, it felt like a download. I was like, oh, we, we want to be in an eco-village. We want to have a Buddhist Christian community. We want to grow food, to live in harmony and loving service and stewardship of, of the earth. We want to have this a practice center where other people and us can practice together a daily schedule. But it was like, voom, like neither of us has had tension or questions or conflict. It was like, oh yeah, this is what we want. We hadn't really talked about it until that point at all. And then within 30 minutes, it was, oh, this is what we want. <laughs> it really felt like it just came to us, like we were being led. That was a year and a half ago. And it's still, so we started this community that meets every month now, a Buddhist Christian community of meditation and action. Every month we have a practice, there's a talk, there's time for interacting, connection. We give some of the donations that come in go to 
children in Ukraine, a young man in Delhi who lived in the ashram for homeless people that Adam worked in and is now wanting, raising a family, needs a car to be a taxi driver, we're raising money for, the, anyway, so there's some action coming from that, but that's the little seed of whatever might come in the future of some kind of residential community. Maybe it's a training center and people start to join us, maybe families or couples or single people over time where people have their own livelihoods, but where we have some kind of common practice. And then people come for a certain period of time to get trained. And then this larger community can start to build out. Eventually, we've talked about wanting to have low-income housing, places for folks who, without a lot of money who can live and practice if they would like, that we would have our own little house, but that we'd have a common place like a meditation hall or chapel thing and then a dining area. And you know, maybe a CSA is growing food on the land we're on, or maybe there's like projects for permaculture or ecological green building designs and solar and wind and you know renewable energies. It's a training place for that too, where people from the local communities can get employment or training or something as part of what we're doing, but that the heart of it is daily meditation, prayer, weekly coming together to share our insights, our appreciations, maybe a monthly silent desert day where we're fasting or time in silence, solo practice, prayer, things like that, where there's like a regular rhythm and a grounding in study, in practice, in being present for each other, being present for ourselves.